Hello, hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be back. This is our fourth and last TL University series with Nomadic Expeditions. I wanted to firstly thank everyone that has been watching all the different uh, sessions with us, which as you can see here on the screen, we had an amazing introduction to Mongolia. We talked then about the festivals, the culture, the arts, and today we're diving into the Three Camel Lodge and the highlights of the Gobi Desert. If you missed any session, they are all on our YouTube channel, so please do go out there, look for it. They're super informative. There is an incentive for those that watch all four sessions. There is a 15% commission on all bookings uh, made in 2021 for travel through 22. So look out for that. We'll also send you a certificate and uh, an expert badge that you can include on your email, on your websites, as uh, having done all the course in the Being an Expert on Mongolia, which I'm sure your clients will think is fantastic. So if you don't know the team, I wanted to make sure you get to know everybody that's with us. If you're with us, joining us from Brazil, Paula Marques is a face that the Brazilian market is very familiar with. She's your account manager in Brazil. Andrea Cid for Mexico, also overseeing South America, Spanish-speaking countries. We have Anna. She's currently on a boat, but she's based in Chicago. She's our director of sales for North America. And of course, last but not least, the phenomenal gentleman from Nomadic Expeditions. We have Sanjay. Sanjay is the director of operations. He is the Bible of all things Nomadic Expeditions. And last but not least, the CEO, the master of all, the guru, Jalsa, who's the CEO and the creator of this whole magic. So thank you all for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass on the screen to our nomadic team and enjoy the presentation. If you have any questions, if you need any additional information, reach out to us. We're always here to help. Thank you, Tina. And share screen for us. Oh, okay, doke. Sanjay is my technical supervisor here. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here and share with you some history and uh, the surroundings of the, the Three Camel Lodge in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. If uh, This is some of the imagery there set in the... The Gobi Desert is one of the northernmost deserts of the world. It's also one of the higher altitude deserts. It's a semi-arid desert. It's rich in a variety of flora and fauna. Only about one third of the desert itself is covered with sand or sand dunes. It's a, a series of rolling step-like grasslands, grazing pastures, and also uh, some varied mountains and uh, prehistoric streams that sort of have carved some of these canyons we'll see later. So going back to Mongolia, we can, so you can see the destinations that we also do over the last 30 years. Uh, we also specialize in Tibet, Nepal, Bhutan, and India. I'm very proud of Sanjay here, who's been, I guess, Condé Nast's uh, top travel specialist, specialist for the Himalayas for quite some time in India, nice. well over a decade, closer to two probably. So as you know, Mongolia is totally surrounded by Russia and China. Access points are uh, Korea, Beijing, uh, Istanbul, uh, with direct flights. Uh, the, the Turkish Airlines fly through Bishkek, but uh, also Moscow and Berlin. Uh, Seoul, uh, Japan, Osaka. There are uh, access routes. There are uh, not daily, but there are periodic flights during regular tourist season from Hong Kong as well. This gives you some idea of where we're situated, the Three Camel Lodge, closer to the southern border of Mongolia. In the middle of the Gobi National Park, the Three Gobi's National Park. This is some video of uh, it's a little stalled, huh? Just press the button again. Sorry about that. Just a little view of, uh, we, we use all four-wheel drive vehicles. As you see these wide open spaces here, the history of the lodge is that uh, I grew up in a Mongolian community, the first Mongolian community in the Western Hemisphere in New Jersey in the United States. And I started as a young man as a carpenter. So when we, uh, I envisioned the lodge, I read a book when I was a young boy, a teenager, about Mongolian architecture by a famous author in Mongolia. And he talked about mortise and tenon construction. They call it the Suma style, which is the temple style of construction. And you'll see throughout Asia different hip roof construction. The roof was constructed with no nails. And of course, uh, the goal was to maintain authenticity. So those uh, are all the guest rooms. They're, they, we call them gyers. Uh, they're known as yurts in the Western world. You'll see how they evolve and become quite comfortable. The lodge is very much a community center. We also have an organic greenhouse. It's a very contained, it's a nestled up against that volcanic rock outcropping behind it. And uh, that's been there probably for 180 million years or longer. 
there were actually a few petroglyphs when I first was sighting the lodge that were carved into some of the rocks on the, on the hilltop there. It's a beautiful plateau where you have a, a, a 360 degree view of daylight, at sunrise, sunset. So it's a, it's a great place for sundowners and also for sunrise coffee and photography. We also utilize a yoga platform you'll see later. We have 38 deluxe gens, meaning the, the gens have attached on sweep uh, showers, stone showers and, uh, and toilets. And uh, we have two suites that have an adjoining, they have a center uh, connected. So it would be two gens with a gen in the center that has the bathroom and showers. This is one of the suites, the living room. And we can reconfigure that to, to suit whatever families need. They're great. It's a great family uh, connection. And this connects to a bathroom and then the, on the other side would be the sleeping quarters. All the furniture is made by our carpenters and made uh, all the bedroom furniture and all the, the, the accommodations in traditional Mongolian style. The get itself is an amazing structure. You see the lattice walls. It is one of the strongest wood frame structures in the world. The lattice walls actually are only about a quarter to three eighths of an inch thick. And because of the cylinder, the way it's been built, all of the wind that any force exerted on it is distributed throughout the entire structure. So uh, the saying goes that Buckminster Fuller, a physicist architect uh, many years ago in the, I believe, late 40s, stayed in again and was fascinated because he saw the cylinder created by this diamond shape and the lattice being expandable. So as physicists, architects think, he, uh, he decided if he cut these diamonds in half and were, was able to hinge them, he could create a curve or a cylinder in two directions. Hence, the idea or brainstorm for the geodesic dome was born from a year or again. Again, more of our carpenters' handiwork. It's just amazing to be able to look out the window and just see wide open spaces. These are the showers and the uh, attached toilet facilities, one of the typical bathrooms. This is our main restaurant, Bulk Thai, and uh, we have an assortment of, uh, of cuisine there, everything from Western to Mongolian traditional dishes. The main lodge building is come to be known as Dino Hall, obviously because uh, of our early start with paleontological expeditions and work with the American Museum of Natural History, the Royal Terrell Museum of uh, the Rockies, uh, the Tate Museum in Wyoming. So we've been uh, involved with many, many paleontological expeditions and uh, the, the Gobi Desert is truly a mecca for paleontological discovery. This is our bar in the main lodge building. Uh, we've got a wide selection. We have over 100 whiskeys in stock there from everywhere from Japan to, to Scotland to uh, you name it. It's quite amazing. We also have quite a fine selection of wines as well. It's quite surprising for many of our visitors to find such a selection in the middle of the desert. We have an underground screening room, the Snow Leopard Den, where we use for presentations, lectures. It's quite comfortable. Also, we have... Uh, videos and uh, available for people to look at some of the, the documentaries and the, the, some of the movies that Mongolia has become known for, The Eagle Huntress, The Weeping Camel. This is our new spa called Arashan. Arashan means holy water. Mongolians will see, you'll see them often along the side of a road where there's a spring coming out of a rock outcropping or, or a mountain, and they'll be there collecting the water because they feel it helps uh, cure uh, illnesses and remedies uh, other in, in overall for good luck and health. So we named it Arshan, which is a term applied to that holy water. This is right under the main lodge building, uh, private treatment rooms, three private treatment rooms and showers. These are some of the activities. Obviously, I think uh, you can see the list there. I think it's great when people can actually engage in it. They actually can build again and take it down. It's uh, a Mongolian family can do it in about 25 to 35 minutes, a mother and father and a child or two. So we have our own stables there. So uh, when you ride, because uh, Mongolian ponies, after they've been out grazing all winter, can become a little feral. So we like that our animals are socialized and, uh, and well-trained. Mongolian horses are Ponies by Western standards, they're about 11 to 12 hands high, but they're quite tough. Uh, these are the horses that the Chinggis Khan used to conquer the largest empire, connect, contiguous empire in the world in the 13th century. Not the same one, but <laughs> we've also got a variety of equipment there. We've got electric mountain bikes, manual mountain bikes, 
We've got uh, electric scooters. Uh, again, there's one of the Getter building demonstrations and participating. We've got a yoga instructor, uh, food, the dumpling making classes, which is the national dish of Mongolia. Some of the excursions that take us out. Oops, lost that one. Huh? I can go back, right, Sanch? No. It didn't let me. Like one more time. I think this is an interesting place. It's called the Flaming Cliffs. So uh, back in 1923, Roy Chapman Andrews, who was uh, the director of archaeology at the American Museum of Natural History, and later went on to become the overall director, uh, was launched the first motor vehicle expedition in Asia back in 1923 with a few Dodge vehicles, six or seven, I believe it was. He uh, drove over 250 miles across from Beijing, across the Mongolian border and 250 miles north, looking for the origins of man. Unfortunately, he didn't discover uh, any specimens of mankind or ancient man there, but he collected over 2,000 different specimens of species of animals, uh, fossils, uh, plant life. So it was quite an amazing adventure for him. On his return to Beijing, as he was driving across the relatively flat step, you can see in the background, sun was starting to set and he saw this sand formations and, and these cliffs. And as the sun set, became brighter and brighter and he, saw, he called it the Flaming Cliffs. Now he made camp, I'll show you a spot where he made camp uh, in a future slide. And he saw these cliffs and then they moved closer to the cliffs the second night. And when mother nature called, one of the members of the party in the expedition went outside of their tent and, and found uh, the first nest of dinosaurs intact. So the American Museum of, Nat uh, Museum of Natural History is still is uh, conducting their longest expedition ever. They've been digging there since, I think, uh, it's over 32 years now. So back to uh, 1989. And uh, it's the same desert where director of archaeology uh, found the first nest of dinosaur eggs. And years later, a team with Mike Novacek and Mark Norell found a perfect embryo. They were both on the cover of Newsweek and Time. Uh, it was a, it was a cross-section of, of, of an egg with the, the same species inside. It helped change paleontological theory when they to prove that dinosaurs were not cold-blooded reptilian, but they acted much more like birds and nurtured their eggs and hatched their young. This is a beautiful valley that's about an hour, less than an hour from uh, our lodge. Again, one of the streams that carved this basal gorge, which is about 300 feet deep. In the winter, that stream and the ice pack, because of the egress is so tight, uh, the water doesn't escape as rapidly. So the ice pack, when it gets to, it can get as low as 50 below zero in the winter, builds up about 100 feet, 90 to 100 feet high. So when we come back in the spring, you'll see the spring flowers, but you'll also see this, the ice sometimes will last until July. But in early June, you can walk on a river of frozen ice in the middle of a desert when it's 75, 80 degrees out. We have, we actually have clamp bonds for, for people if they want to hike in the the river valley. This is also a natural snow leopard domain and, and habitat. It's very interesting because all the stone that was we used to build Three Camel Lodge was quarried by hand from this very valley. It's called Hutskai Valley, is, is our whole township. But uh, we heard news of this mother and two cubs, and we sent a couple of our, our team and the photographer. This is literally 26 or 30 kilometers from our lodge. But we, uh, we've we been trying to make sure the local herders uh, with our various programs don't disturb them, and uh, we want them to grow because biologists have now determined that Mongolia has probably the second largest population of snow leopards in the world. And there's another place within the same Gobi Desert in the National Park that's a new highly protected area that has as many as 60 uh, snow leopards within a 100-mile radius. So it's quite a dense, probably the most dense, highest population in such a small area in the world. Not that you'll get to see them. This was very, we tracked these uh, leopards for weeks after following their tracks and hearing from the local herdsmen about them. I guess you didn't, I didn't see the bunker project, but again, another shot of the Flaming Cliffs. The vastness, you know, we say in Mongolia, only in wide open spaces do you truly have vision. This is where Andrews on his expedition first saw the, the cliffs as he was uh, heading back towards Beijing. This is the rock outcropping on top of our, uh, behind our lodge. As, it can, as you can see, the vast panoramas there. We'll often set up for dinners and whatever events people care to partake in there. We have a little sunset bar set up there as well. Knowing a little bit about why we built the lodge and how, oh, the almost 100% of our lighting is solar and a good portion of our power is generated by solar. We really believe in being a part of the local community. We use uh, local suppliers. 
All of the meat products are, that we source in the Gobi are all organic. They're non-GMO, no hormones. Uh, they're, uh, I, I can't say cruelty-free because of the minus 50 in the winter when they're grazing. But, but uh, again, when we, we have that combined with our greenhouse, we've been uh, zero single-use plastic for quite a number of years. Everyone who arrives either through nomadic expeditions or at the lodge, we'll receive stainless steel cups and we have filling stations with purified water. So that no one, but the water actually is quite good. It comes from approximately 330 feet deep. And so it's quite a high in the pH. It's actually better than, uh, than uh, Fiji. But again, some people are, are cautious about drinking abroad. So the whole idea, Mogi, our chef there, he, he was a dishwasher a decade ago, and she cooks uh, amazing dishes. She's been, we've sent her, brought her to the U.S. We've brought chefs there to train. The whole lodge is a model of empowerment and giving people opportunity. We're 100% staffed by Mongolians. In fact, our president just left to fly to Mongolia from New Jersey. Our president, Undra Brinemic, actually is Mongolian native born and raised and uh, went back to see her family and also to see our team there. She oversees our operations in the U.S. as well. So we're very proud of that. Being a part of the community, helping to preserve cultural treasures of Mongolia is important. This school, for example, is the only countryside school where children study their regular curriculum and they study the traditional uh, musical instruments, song, dance. We're very proud of them. Literally, it's funny, I, I met them when I was invited to, of all places, I met them in uh, Middletown, Ohio, well over a decade ago. Uh, the U.S. ambassador invited me there because they were having a festival celebrating Mongolia. And I heard these kids singing and performing. I asked them where they were from, and they told me they were from Hanahongar, which is 75 kilometers from our lodge. And ever since then, the, the two founders, the husband and wife team, who are uh, graduated from the, the, the National Arts uh, uh, Performing Arts School in the university in the capital, uh, started the school. So they, they've been summertime uh, regular attendees and entertaining our clients. We're very happy. We also, Nomadic Expeditions and 3 Came Alive, sent uh, a group of the children to the International Children's Music Festival three years ago, ago, I believe, in Ankara, Turkey, which was an amazing thing. These are all herders, kids, and local children who may never get out of uh, Gobi in their lives. It's just an amazing thing to be able to do things like that for them. This is our team, everyone from chefs to carpenters. This is pretty much our full-time staff, but uh, we, we do expand in the summers as uh, the capacity grows. This is a short video, if you uh, can. I don't know if the sound's on. Is it? it should. Oh, yeah. What are you doing to type? Fire's house have been disconnected. Wi-Fi is gone. Stop working. I'm disconnected. You're good. You're, you're hardwired.
So I like to tell people, you know, when you come to the lodge, when you go out at night, you're away from any reflected or refracted light, away from any of the cities or town centers or province centers. And you can look up and it looks like, it feels like you can grab the stars out of the sky. I coined this term a long time ago. I told people that we are a 5 billion star hotel. Fortunately, I should have uh, printed it or copyrighted it, but uh, it literally is like that. You can see the Milky Way there. We also do things like we have uh, Professor Dolma. She's an astrophysicist from the Academy of Sciences. She's uh, expanding her doctorate, uh, getting another PhD in Japan. But we, uh, we started, we built the screening room initially for her. And she would spend the summers there with her telescope. And it's quite a different experience when you have an astrophysicist with a laser pointer doing, uh, pointing out the constellations and giving you a 3D presentation on the creation of the solar system before you go out and stargaze. We try to do things uh, with a little higher level of comfort and also content and authenticity. You know, there are other operators that use the old Russian vans and there's a nostalgic and they're very useful. But, you know, we have a, we use modern four wheel drives, uh, land cruisers. Uh, we try to give our people the comfort and yet we'll go out and we do dinosaur digs or horse trekking for even weeks. We've had clients go on 30, 45 day horse treks. So, but when they, it's time to dust off and come to relax, it's uh, so certainly our expeditions are not of that nature required to be, you know, require horseback riding. We, we have our, our guides our trained guides who help uh, show you all throughout the country. It's i uh, I'm very proud of 3KM Lodge. Uh, I designed it along with a husband and wife, Longoyne architect. We, again, I told you we built it with no nails and I'm in the home building and construction business in the U S and uh, probably built about somewhere around 14 or 15,000 homes in the U S during the three years it took me to build the 3KM Lodge because we did it all by hand, but it was an amazing experience. Uh, some really great Mongolian carpenters. We didn't have any power equipment. I mean, we had power saws, but we didn't have any cranes or any large heavy equipment to lift all the ridge poles. We did it all by hand. So it was a great experience. And it's a wonderful place uh, when you come and you can, you know, all of the locals are also quite proud of you. But it's a, we, we, we welcome you. And if there's any questions or on, on that note, I guess I'll hand it back to you, Tina. And how would I do that? Just stop. Shana, just I'm share. here. Just I'm stop just sharing. I just jump in. That's what I do. Jasa, you've created you've created magic. It's just mind boggling to watch these scenes, uh, and not only with Three Camel Lodge and Nomadic, but with your your team as well, which. Uh, I'm very fond of. We have a, just a quick question, I, which I thought was very interesting from Kim asking, can you talk about the dogs? Oh yeah. You know, I'm surprised we didn't have the photos there. We started a kennel about two years ago, building a kennel because I, we've been supporting the, uh, the Mongolian Mankhur project. So the Mankhur is a, it's commonly called a Mastiff, but it's a ancient dog breed that's native to Mongolia. It's also first cousins with the Tibetan Mastiff. And uh, we supported them and they gifted me because we hosted them and we were supporting the project where they're raising bunkers to give to herders, which in turn helps protect snow leopards and wolves and different populations. Because obviously as the, the herds uh, grow and when game is scarce, wild game is scarce, uh, leopards and wolves and things will attack uh, the herds. With the Mongolian Mastiff there, he, he will successfully scare off snow leopards, wolves, etc. And so they, they started this program and they gave me a puppy. His name is Barbus. So when uh, I saw what they were doing, he's just, uh, I love him. And uh, of course, he's all the way in Mongolia. But I, uh, you know, he was starting to get older and we thought he was getting lonely. So we decided to build the kennels and join the Mongolian Bunker Project and uh, Bruce Elfstrom and built the kennels to, to their specifications and the training. We raised them with baby goats and sheep. And we just had three puppies because Ganuba joined Barbus, and so we have a couple there. We have three puppies, and we just placed two of them with local herders to help, again, protect their herds and to, in, in, in turn and indirectly, or almost directly, they help protect the snow leopards. Because if they do kill the game, or the herds, the, the domesticated livestock, they will go after them, even though they're officially protected because they're out in the countryside and that's the rule of nature. But by uh, scaring them off and uh, keeping them at bay, uh, it helps to protect them from being hunted. So it's a great program. And you'll see the kettles behind the lodge. It's a, 
right on our, our grounds there. We're also unofficial protectors of uh, over 20,000 hectares there. Uh, we against fossil poaching, animal poaching. As I told you, we also work with the local community to help educate them about snow leopards. It's been a great, before I got approvals to build the lodge, I had to visit 65 of the local herding families and explain what we were doing. Many of them were quite bewildered as to why I wanted to build something that looked old. <laughs> so the concept of rustic luxury in Mongolia had just become a democracy. They were, they were really they used to hearing about gleaming pyramids and steel and glass structures. But, you know, I came to Mongolia in 1990 uh, when the first Democratic prime minister uh, invited me because I hosted them in our Mongolian community in the U.S. And when I went there originally in 1990, I went with a plan to help them create with Morgan Stanley, a uh, Goldman Sachs, we came up with the Mongolia Fund so we could develop a cellular phone system that would in turn fund five lodges in five national parks and help them create concessions so they could have revenue. And they didn't get it. It didn't get passed. And the gentleman I brought to Mongolia started the cell phone business and didn't do it. The, didn't build the lodges. But so 10 years after Nomadic Expedition started doing uh, expeditions in Mongolia, we built the Three Camel Lodge. I finally built it because I thought it was certainly not to compete with Mongolians, but it was to help Mongolia compete with the rest of the world. And I think we've been successful. And i uh, I think, uh, I don't think I'll physically be involved, but we're looking for a site to build a, a, a second lodge. We've been seeking approvals or, to do it again, a little bit different style. So that's the plans. And I think uh, Sanjay and Undre and everyone will continue it, with it as well as, as myself. So. It's a, it's a beautiful story. It's extremely fascinating. And I was just thinking that there's so much to be told on the sustainability side as well. There's so much story to be told. I mean, you know, we could do episodes and episodes of TL Universities. It'll be never ending. But I, I know everybody has a busy schedule. And trust me, Jelsa and I could continue, you know, I can continue asking questions and he could continue telling stories forever. But I wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, please do reach out directly to any one of us from my team, from Nomadic Expeditions, Undra, Sanjay, Nikita, all of them are phenomenal. If you have any questions, you know, there's never a bad time to plan a trip to Mongolia. So please do reach out for us. Thank you so much. If you missed the previous sessions, again, please look out in our YouTube channel. They're all there. And if you need any additional training, do reach out to us. Jalsa, Sanjay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are amazing. Oh, thank you all, Tina. And, and really, I've been under strict orders to try to contain myself. If any of you have met me, you know that I'll keep going I'm on for over. It's amazing. <laughs> You're like a new man. Yeah. And the fact that Undra could keep you so well controlled from Mongolia is just phenomenal. You know, she has uh, she has that powerful influence. <laughs> That's why she's president. But uh, but seriously, anyone, any information, I'm available, uh, accessible. You can reach me and I'm happy to answer any questions or have a much longer conversation if you could spare the time. Thanks. Thank you all. Thanks to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. The TL team. Thanks thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. And thank you, Sanjay. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.